Okay, the thing I wanted to say is like we want to uh, this motherfucker wanna make fun from everybody. Okay. No, I'm not making fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We are trying to surprise him. Okay. It's not surprised anymore because I say that I spoiled him. We are going to uh, have a schedule like he is a stand really really good stand up comedian and we are going to make him at least once a month to have a show here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I want you guys. <laughs> we just made it public, so it has to happen. Yeah. <laughs> this guy is incredible, and Welcome to Fractured Podcast, episode 10. Wow, bravo us. Yeah, man. Really, amazing, 10 episodes. We are still talking about refugee experience within Greek education because we have really amazing guest, uh, Erina Mustaka. Amazing conversation with you. I still have with me Douglas Herman and uh, Davud Nouri. So let's dive in right into it. Elena, is there any difference to access education between kids who are from different countries, for example, Ukraine, uh, or, and the difference between uh, people from Iran, Syria, and also, is there any difference by the age of the access to education? I'll start with the age requirement. Um, so it's obligatory, legally mandatory for kids up to the age of 15 to attend education in Greece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, um, and then they attend education until they're 17. We've, uh, we've worked with a lot of unaccompanied minors. They were hosted in two shelters and the shelter actors who act as their um, guardians for as long as they, they are in Greece. Um, they, they usually register them in public education and what we did, especially on Lesbos through Gecko, is support that journey by helping them learn the Greek language, integrate, learn, understand the way that the school system works, school e etiquette, and so forth. Um, so we build a, a parallel um, world for them, let's say. But at the same time, a lot of the kids that potentially were had needs or requirements that were not fulfilled by the public educational uh, sector, uh, they had an opportunity to come to us and, and be supported outside of the formal educational system. I was discussing this before with Douglas, and that's how Better Days develop their accreditation pathways in English, in Greek, in IT, and so forth. Um, now, in terms of nationalities, uh, as I said, like um, we have a very diverse uh, body of students. Um, we worked with Ukrainian children as well in the past few years in, in Athens. Um, obviously, their experience of integrating into the public educational system is different because the policies that enables integration into the Greek society and um, environment are much friendlier um, for Ukrainian refugees. Um, because they get their international protection almost immediately after they arrive. They are not in this gray, insecure, and often hostile environment of what is going to happen with my asylum, fighting, um, rejections, trying to get answers, navigating a really difficult bureaucratic system in a language they don't speak, right? So st it's it has been, I believe, an easier experience for a Ukrainian um, family to receive aid and information in Greece than a non-Ukrainian refugee. Um, also though, from my understanding, uh, at least with my connection with the Ukrainian diaspora and the Ukrainian families that we work with, um, they're, they're, they have their own network of support that is provided from the Ukrainian diaspora and the 
and the people, the, the, the Ukrainians that have already, the generations of Ukrainians okay. that have already established here and they have their businesses and their homes and everything. So they, they were a, a safety net for a lot of the Ukrainian families that ended up in, in Greece. Um, I think that a lot of the people that come, uh, that my, especially the migration, let's say demographics that we've seen post 2015, um, there were, you know, predominantly Syrian. Now we see a lot of Palestinians, Af Afghans, depending on what crisis uh, was evolving at the time. Um, and o and also with with these influxes, um, some had it better with others. Um, there is, for example, a a recent um, le legal initiative where. Um, people, refugees from certain countries um, receive immediate protection also. Now I think it's um, Afghans um, and Palestinians, I think. Um, I'm not really sure actually of the nationalities. I don't want to say something that isn't accurate, but it's, def it's, it's change of the over the years. When I started responding here, I was working predominantly with Syrians, for example, and they were immediately they will get their papers, blue stamp, they will move on, go wherever they want. Moroccans, um, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, done. The minute that they were seen, they were arrested, they'll go in detention and you'd never see them again. So there was always different behaviors um, that we've observed. Mm. I just really, I don't understand, like they have two nationalities, they have the same rights, they are both refugees and one easier for to access education the other one no i don't know yeah, it's a little bit weird <laughs> so david uh what would make you love going to school describe to us the ideal environment for you the same way as you love coming to reef hoax and learn what would as you're saying the same <laughs> way so um <coughs> Like for sure, there has to be something like interesting, to like interesting for these students to go and learn something, mm -hmm. and like especially making friends. It's really important making friends seriously. Yeah, it's really important because um, in this school I'm in now, you can see like seriously there you can see like there is 50 students. No one talk to another one. Maybe like they can talk to each other, at least like other like to. I mean, it has to be like in your, uh, like it, he has to talk uh, in the same, we ne you need to talk th in the same language, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you just talk with someone who like talks the same language with you, yeah. And other thing is like to learn something, yeah. As a student, I can say, okay, I was in Iran, I was going to school, It I had the same situation like uh, with this uh, new, mm -hmm. with this new school I was in. Um, because like in in the school I was in Iran, it was like the same situation because uh, students were coming from different areas, yeah, and there were always fight between them and this kind of stuff. But here is like mo it's m more pressure, more pressure, and the thing is like mm, to learn something, yeah, and you need to accept that is really hard. It's not your mother tongue. Yeah, it's not your mother tongue, but you know, as I said, like you know the way. You need to like get up. You need to go. You need to study. Okay, you have the way. You have the way, but here nothing. You don't know what to do. That's why uh, I had a really bad depression. But if I go to new school, I would say yeah. At least they have to try to like to push me also. Yeah, to push me also to teach me. Yeah, and. Yeah, like because the first school I was in, it was really good. Like I remember, like uh, they were calling to my social worker. Hey, today this guy had, I don't know, like <coughs> math math class, and the teacher gave them homeworks. Uh, is he trying to fix and like to write the homeworks or no? Like they were really taking care. Yeah, and that's motivate people. Okay, you 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 don't go for any like you have a reason to go because someone take care of your like okay y he doesn't know you y he know like you are a refugee mm -hmm. but he cares and it means to me also 
but perspectives are different. There's always good and bad students. Yeah. Okay, so say some sort of personal, uh, 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 perfect world, and next year we get Davoud back into a school that he wants to be in, and then while he's actively enrolled and he's studying and he is, as you put it earlier, an active student who's attending more than 60% of the time, what happens to his housing and his refugee status when he turns 18? Well, all this fun information that we're exchanging. <laughs> I have. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, mm -hmm. I mean, like an 18-year-old birthday is supposed to be like a, a rite of passage, uh, an yeah. exciting time, a, a really great, wonderful moment. And then it, it's become like a, a th something to dread. Can I start with a story? Yeah. When Moria burned, uh, we were one of the first responders, let's say, um, to identify and accompany minors that were living in the shelters. Um, and access inside the camp for a while was restricted as they were trying to put the fire out and so forth. Um, but a lot of the kids saw us, started coming down, so we started getting attendance of the kids that we recognized. Um, it was us, but also the first reception officers and representing the, the ministry, let's say, that had the, the official guardianship of, of all these kids. Um, anyway, most of the kids were found, um, but then we were missing a few, so we're trying to coordinate it with actors that were responding on OHF side, on Karatepe side. Um, to cut a long short, a story short, um, we entered the space because one of our um, students and unaccompanied minor said, that my friend is inside, he won't go. And we're like, there's nobody inside. The firefighters and everybody came, cleared everything out, like there's nobody. How is this even possible? He goes, no, like he didn't want to come out. He's de depressed. So we, we go in and walk into this section which was completely burned and demolished. There was nothing standing other than two containers. And indeed, um, I think his name was Ali. I'm not really sure right now. It's been a few years. He was covered. He covered his bed with a sheet so you couldn't really see that he was under there so I actively had to go and push the sheet and find him and I was pu you know pulling my hair I'm like what are you doing here like there's a fire like everybody evacuated like we're we're taking everybody to Tapua like all of that and he's like I don't want to go I'm like what do you mean you don't want to go I just want to stay here and I just want to die Whoa. I don't want to go and I'm like it's not an option like we're gonna go let's go and he just wouldn't move. And I said, I don't understand. Why aren't you coming? He goes, because I'm turning 18 tomorrow. And what will my life be anyway? So I think that represents many of the, a lot of the stress and the anxiety that kids unaccompanied minors close to 18 face. Um, and also the, the m emotional and mental state they go as they turn 18, adulthood is like this huge, huge monstrous type of like mountain that they need to climb and they don't have the skills or the equipment or the faith even that they will make it up the hill or up the mountain. Um, and it takes a, lo a long time for us to build trust and reestablish trust in themselves when we work with kids that are closer to 18 or have turned 18 already. Um, and that is because when they do turn 18 and close to turning 18, they're told and they're aware of the fact that they're going to lose access to a lot of the services that they receive as unaccompanied minors, uh, which includes um, shelter, social support, food, all of the basic aid, clothing, access to education, legal aid, and so forth. Um, and they're the most fortunate of them might be given an opportunity to transition in temporarily transition into a semi-independent living facility for a year, for six months. Um, but many of these kids and many of the kids that we worked with ended up homeless, um, having to smuggle themselves in other places because they didn't know what to do in Greece, so putting themselves in unnecessary additional danger. Um, and and I think part of why Gecko in Athens has expanded the population to work with youth is to tackle that specific transition. And we've been very vocal about 
getting actor supporters um, identify kids that are plus 17 um, in, in that age range where like we feel that Gecko can give them the attention, the commitment and the perhaps the solutions or co-design solutions with them and set tangible objectives. You know, you might, you might, you know, you might want to be, I don't know, get your toy filled by the end of this year. That might not be a tangible goal. And it's like our role to consult you, mentor you, guide you through understanding that setting an objective that is tangible is the best thing for you mentally, emotionally, physically, and learning wise. So we'll set a goal that is attainable for you and, and escort you through meeting that. So we might be like, okay, you're not going to get your TOEFL certification at the end of the year, perhaps. We'll try, we'll work towards taking you through the levels, but you're, let's say, beginner's level. So aiming for that might not be doable, but we'll work towards that with a larger time frame, let's say. So with a lot of these kids is accepting the situation they're in and helping them do that and also understanding that they still have a support system and um, that together we can build something where where they they can still flourish and progress and achieve their, I don't know, their dreams, but have safety and security and integrate and be independent without having to put themselves through marketing again and no, um, no. you know <coughs> desperate you had, things you had this case like Ali J so he was like one of my friends here and um, he was with me one of my uh, classmates here in refocus classes yeah and he turned to 18 18 and they kicked him out from the shelter and seriously he had nowhere to go yeah and God thanks really God thanks he got his passport and we had this family here they Sudan really really helped them, really helped him, yeah, really helped him. And but uh, the bad thing is like he he went to the Germany and now he's just spending his time in the camps again. That's really really like really big issue, yeah. I think non formal and any non profit actor that works with this population right now. Ha, can play a very significant role um, in mentoring and supporting and perhaps escorting uh, kids from, you know, into adulthood, let's say. You've done it. I know you've done. Um, coaching, mentoring, being a friend, being committed, um, being honest, providing information, going out of, the, of your way to advise um, the way you'd advise a brother, a uh, friend, you know, and I think this is this is where I uh, I become very eager to like get in contact with populations that, that with kids that are in that transition in the seventeen before they start becoming very desperate and thinking that the only solution forward is, uh, is X is be able to have that conversation and say, well, X is an option, not the best in my opinion, but why don't we explore other options? And let's see then, like, let's decide then at the end. Let's not be so adamant that the only way forward is for you to smuggle yourself to Germany and perhaps still have to face exactly, adversity yeah. and homelessness and everything else. So let's, let's see down and see perhaps there's another way. We have time, whether it's through school, education, finding employment, whatever it is, or all of that and more, let's sit down and let's see how we can on one-on-one figure out a plan for you. And I think this is what GECO does ultimately. Yes, we do provide education, but the, the emphasis is on planning. Let's plan um, what is, where can you be in the next six months or a year. And let's set goals that are realistic and attainable and they, 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 they work towards whatever you want to be, wherever you want to go. And I think this is like one of the things that crushes us the hardest. Like we've seen really terrible things on Lesbos, as you were saying before, about the fires and the conditions in the camp before that and then what followed after in the last couple of years. But it's this like young people 
trading their futures for this immediate need of where will I sleep tonight, what will I eat tomorrow, and having no legitimate options of housing, no real chance of integration, no like opportunities. No one. It 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 shocks me that even in the systems, the shelters, and the programs that are mandated to support them up to a certain age, don't have some sense of transitional programming that lasts and then maybe under certain stipulations that say during the next year as you've now transitioned out of being a minor you still have housing but it comes with some responsibilities to in turn ensure that you are like seeking other educational opportunities or employment or that it has a time that it will eventually elapse but it requires some engagement but that there, it's just not there like and you're saying, like, I mean, our students that turn 18 and then suddenly the next day they don't know where they're going to live. It's like, that's insane. And it's just like it's creating other problems that don't need to exist. They just don't need to be. Yeah. It's, it's heartbreaking. And perpetuate the state yeah. of survival and, I don't know, depression and desperation often that ultimately blurs the the way that we make decisions and makes us desperate about the decisions we make and we see i often say that that's the 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 most heartbreaking thing in in working with this population is seeing a child and seeing them being ho hopeless like it's it's terrible well it's also child abuse when they are a yeah. minor because in that last two years or even just that those last months they're still a minor they're supposed to be cared for and be protected and be and supported, and then instead you're terrorizing them for that final year of their childhood. How is that not a crime? Like, this is crazy. I see a lot of support for these kids from NGOs like Better Days, but for me it's not enough because for me everyone who lives in Greece has a responsibility toward these kids. And I remember I wrote this, uh, read this quote by Gandhi, I think, or I don't know, who says, uh, if everybody uh, cleaned in front of their house is the whole street, would be clean you don't have to do it and i want to ask you a question what do you think the greek society or greek uh, people can help to integrate these kids because if you can tell to someone you say no I d i'm not a politician or i don't have an organization but i believe that each one of us including greek uh, citizens can help how can they help these kids integrate um, i mean philosophically i don't think integration is a positive thing because it often give the the impression or is interpreter as they need to assimilate. They came into our space and they need to act the way that we want them to or expect them to, or in a way that doesn't intimidate us or scare us or whatever. Um, so it's it's very um, it's a very charged word for me. I think we should talk more about creating and fostering spaces that welcome, and again, we had conversations with Sonia and Doug about this, that, f that foster um, the participation of local community and other communities in Greece, um, and inten intentionally tries to bring refugee displaced and, and host communities together. And talk and get to know each other and understand each other. Um, I don't think that the way that we've been dealing or addressing integrational programs has worked. Um, xenophobia is still an issue in Greece. There's a lot of discrimination. People report hor horrifying stories um, in Greece and I don't think it's improved uh, in any way. Um, to the point that it escalated and affected aid workers that were working and supporting refugees um, since 2020. Um, and I have a lot of international friends that work in Greece um, with refugees that are <laughs> in fear of their lives because they speak out, um, they've been hit, spit, you know, like intimidated and, and so forth. And a lot of kids, a lot of students, a lot of friends that been targeted with no provocation, no reason whatsoever. They've been targeted because they're brown or they look Asian or whatever, for whatever reason, they didn't 
look Greek, I guess, or speak Greek or whatever it was. Um, so I understand the question, but I think we need to have a conversation where we're not really talking about integration and we're talking about getting to know each other and creating spaces and a society and a country that understands that in a globalized world, we can't just be all Greeks in Greece and that there is a lot for us to learn from other culture and different people and diversify ourselves and be open to that change that will inevitably come anyway. For me, integration, yeah, it's not like uh, you said, yeah, it's not how like I want to become Greek. Just help me build my life the way I see it. For me, this is integration, yeah. I think integration can be a good definition when we're talking about integrating people into the public educational system um, or when we're helping you navigate, let's say, the Greek bureaucracy. Um, like, there's nothing we can do about it. We need to integrate. We need to understand it and, and learn to navigate it. Um, but otherwise, in terms of creating um, a society that accepts you for who you are and respects your religion, um, your beliefs, your whatever, um, and sees you for who you are, a good human being or a bad human being, um, I think I think this this is important. This is how we're gonna create make friends as well. You know, like language shouldn't be a barrier to getting to know people, to making an effort. Um, I have a lot of students that attend public education and haven't made friends, and that is terrible. It affects them profoundly as teenagers. You know, they they feel lonely. Do um, they talk Greek also? They, they they they're getting better in Greek for sure. Um, but I think even even some of my students that are now at university and they're fluent in Greek, they still feel marginalized and left out and find it incredibly, uh, they, 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 they find it um, anxious, can I say that? Mm -hmm. um, almost to socialize with, uh, with Greek people. Um. It's same as me. <laughs> I don't have any Greek friend. I made, I made, but... Mm -mm. You know, and I uh, like as a as a white especially student. When they, yeah, especially when they understand they like, don't talk Greek. We just talk English. Yeah. I was just gonna say that as a white student, when I did my Erasmus in Spain, I spoke no Spanish, although I should, but I didn't. Um, in Spain, in Madrid, very few people were conversational in English, so a lot of my initial social network and relationships were based on you know like you mean this like just just trying tr to translate stuff and to sign language and all of that to cheers a beer and go for a drink and stuff like that um, but it becomes I think more challenging when the labels of refugee comes in and when color and other yeah. separation factors come in and we need to break through those um, taboos, boundaries. I don't know how to call them. Yeah, It's time for commercial break. You're going to hear a testimony from a student that benefits from the Gecko program, amazing program. So support them and see you in a bit. Hi, my name is Khaled. I'm from Afghanistan and I was 12 years old when I left home. My brother and I arrived on Lesbos as accompanied minors. After living in Moya camp for a while, we were sent to a shelter in Mitlini. Um, there we were given the option to attend classes at Kiko Kids. When I first arrived on Gecko, I could not believe how beautiful the space was and how kind everyone were. I felt safe to be myself, I made friends quickly and started joking with my teachers who were always open to talk with us about our everyday problems and thoughts. If we had a problem at the shelter, we would tell better this and they would help. Giga was my happy place. Our teachers would make sure we had a schedule that had the basic lessons like math and English but also we could take classes in things we personally loved, 
For me, those were computers, guitar, football, and photography. One of my favorite classes was photography. It was special to me because not only did I learn about photography, but also we did different projects and exhibitions which are some of the best experiences of my life. I felt valued as a young artist. Our best work was exhibited in galleries on Lesbos and then in Los Angeles and in Washington. Another special moment for me were the performances we gave at the school every year. I loved playing the guitar, singing and dancing. I made many friends at Gecko and even with people whose language and background was so different to mine. But we would work together in class and become friends. I also keep in touch with some of my teachers who have been like mentors to me and really supported me through difficult times. At Gecko, I learned how to coexist with people from all walks of life. I was able to develop long-lasting friendships and believe in my ability to excel. Gecko helped me realize that I could dream big. Being a Gecko student was a, an unforgettable experience. Welcome back to the second uh, part of this episode. Davud, last question for you. How do you stay positive knowing what's going to happen when you turn 18? How do I stay positive? Yeah, how do you deal with this? I can say that I'm, I'm really lucky mm -hmm. because I found Refocus really. Like, it really means to me because really you guys really supporting me really good. And, that's, and it was the only reason I stayed here because, you know, where As I say, increase? in Greece, yeah. Wow. Seriously, the situation is really, you know, I, you know, all of us know about this. And I stay here, and I think I need more information. I need more like lessons from here. And about the schools, like honestly, honestly, like since in, even I was in Afghanistan or Iran, like I wasn't that much interested in school because you know, like uh, controlling or something. But here, just because of refocus. Yeah, even after turning 18, I would like to come and sleep in the lab. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seriously, I would stay. Yeah, until I make it. Is there space? Yeah, I guess yeah. I guess we have to make space. Just get a Murphy bed or something. Yeah, and I think I'm gonna turn 18. Yeah, oh, one year, one year, in one, one year, year more, okay. one year more. Okay, we can prepare bed for you. All right. Change. But I actually, like, I want to mention this, like, really, like, these situations, like, these kind of stuff, like, from school or something, this make this kind of uh, situation that uh, minors, like, they go to, I don't know, to find a black job, I don't know. Mm. Uh, what they call, like, black job or under table? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And or drug dealing or something, like, and then police catch them. And then what's happened? Then again, they're going to say, Yes, it was because of the refugee. Refugees are, you know, mm -hmm. they use them. They, they use this kind of stuff again against against us. And yeah, as a bad example. As a bad example, yeah. And that's make the situation even worse. Um, I don't. I don't. Yeah, there's. I don't know how to address the the concerns that you have at that at that time period you know like I'm thinking about what it was like to be that age in high school and having caring uncles and aunts like who were pushing me to learn how to apply for college and how to take the next big step into adulthood and the idea that I feel we feel lucky that we're facilitating that role for you now um, but it just it's terrible that there are so many people just like yourself who don't have a type of support and Yet, at the same time, inside this country, over these years, we've also seen this be the situation for regular Greek citizens as well. And, and I know in all of our efforts on Lesbos and here now in Athens to work with Greek students to in have, as you're saying, like proper integrative classrooms where people are really getting to know each other and work together and learn from each other, it's really difficult to pull that off because all of the Greek interested parties, the students who would be interested in studying with us, they don't have the time because their own educational system isn't really providing them with the supports they need. So then they spend all their time 
interestingly enough, in kind of personalized education, after the school day is over, and then they don't have any time free to study the things they really want to, because they need to do those things to just get into university, normally abroad, somewhere else, right? And then they're, they're Greece is suffering from a, a flight of their potentially best and brightest, and another generation that's looking ex elsewhere. And I'm wondering if it is it's feasible for the program that you created to be applicable to the Greek po population in that way. That, I mean, but maybe not be funded by private dollars. Is there? Do you think there's a possibility of it being funded by the state to keep people in the country to train and you know kind of create another generation of proud, skilled, edu fully educated, uh, you know, Greek citizens who don't want to go overseas for education because they, they have the supports they need here to, to stay? Do you think that's possible? I mean, sure. Who am I to say it's impossible, right? Um, but at the same time, I think it's a huge endeavor um, that perhaps deserves our time um, in the sense of exploring how we can bridge the gap, perhaps, or address this obstacle um, in a way that benefits the student. Uh, ultimately, whether you're in non-formal education or public education, your, your, your focus is on providing high-quality services to a child, a young person that is trying to build a life for themselves, right? So whatever type of complementary services a nonprofit organization is offering through GEGO, let's say, um, is still, we still hope that it offers that as a complementary service to the services that they receive from a public school, let's say, or a private school in that sense um, that can accredit them with certificates and stuff. Um, but, I mean, that we both know it's like the the greek state is suffering is has perhaps took on a lot a lot on and has i feel kind of stagnated in very important sectors of the of the society uh, whether that's health or education um the system is has been like this forever. Kids that are preparing for the Panhellenic exams have to finish school and then go and invest another five hours to attend private tutorials or small group tutorials um, to pass their exams because they're not prepared at school, at school for those exams. And then their parents need to work day and night to actually cover the cost of that private education. Um, of course, we can set up um, geckos that can provide an alternative solution for these people who have to work day and night to provide for their kids so that they have an opportunity to advance education. Um, but I don't, I don't really know if the funding is there, if the willingness is there for the system to change. Um, there we're talking about very structural changes to the way that the educational system is working. And I think it'll take years and a lot of will um, for that to be achieved. I also feel that when institutional money and nonprofit actors come together, the marriage is not always, what's the word? Friendly, positive, <laughs> not abusive. <laughs> so I also fear that many times there might be an opportunity for that coexistence to happen, for that partnership to exist, but then the dynamics of the relationship, because they're so abusive, they, they affect our ability to bring the results that we want. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. I actually found it very difficult. I think it, uh, you know, I think it did. I'm, it's, I don't know, maybe I'm still an optimist in that it's feasible for us to get to a place where our, our students and interested citizens of, of this, you know, in this city or wherever we, wherever, whatever country we're in, local people who want to learn the same things could see this as an opportunity for themselves as well. And then also that they could look to um, a person with a refugee background as their educator, 
as their mentor and to just turn this upside down that this attitude that everyone who's coming here is just taking is not true but, but how do we you know if we could find a way to get some sustainable funding as you're saying like for this type of educational model to work how cool would it be if it's just the other way around and that Dahoud's the teacher and the mentor <laughs> definitely and a bunch of 15 16 year old local kids from the neighborhood are his students that would, perhaps that would be it, as a private initiative it's much more doable um but I think, or maybe I misunderstood the question. I thought you asked whether, how can the government and programs like GECO come together to um, cater to the needs of the local student well, that community? Yeah. yeah. I do think that it might be more doable and more possible um, of a scenario to happen, you know, within our lifetime <laughs> um, that we bring together resources and expertise um as a private sector to to create something like that and i'm, I'm sure there are a lot of initiatives like odysseia recently i think launched a, a sailing program that caters both to you know it's like the acceptance criteria quite broad um and i think it's not their first program definitely that's been open in terms of the population um and we did it before we didn't have much success but of course we can try again do it better, do it more systematically, find better partners, get the buy-in of the local community, which sometimes is difficult, um, but yeah, it's definitely not impossible. We're both optimistic in that, yeah, in that way. Yeah, well, I think you know where we stand on this. <laughs> right? We want to see uh, Davud and Rashid, Ali and Suda, and everyone else in our team become the Shifus, and then mm -hmm. the local guys can be the grasshoppers. Yeah, but it's just something fun. I found a lot of fun facts about geckos, <laughs> Do it's uh, does anyone here knows what are the geckos? Davut. This is the name of the organization. These are the geckos. And what the, the and the logo. Oh yeah, like they're wonderful. Lizard. These are you know lizard, it's a yeah. lizard. Yeah, everyone thinks actually they're called geckos because yeah. of the stupid car commercials. Yeah. Yeah. Like exactly. <laughs> Do you know them? Thank you so much. Yeah. So and I found a lot of similarities between geckos and refugees. <laughs> so uh, let's start. Geckos uh, amazing toes help them stick to any surface. Except Teflon, like uh, <laughs> like you know, like refugees, we go everywhere, we stick there. But I was when I read this, they said except <laughs> Teflon. Uh, when I when I when I googled what is Teflon, I found us it's the pan. You don't I was know like, what is Teflon. Who's trying to fry Teflon, uh, uh, fry like geckos, so they know like oh they cannot stick there. How do they know that they don't stick there? All right, another one. Gecko's <laughs> eyes. Gecko's <laughs> eyes are 350 times more sensitive to light than human eyes. They can even see color in the dark. And that's really helpful when you're crossing the borders. Wow. Really, wow. Like really, really amazing. Wow. Wow. Geckos are, uh, geckos are able to produce various sounds for communication, including barks and chirps and clicks. And that's the same as refugees. I remember I lived in a, in a room where we were eight and eight different languages. And we were communicating. We were having dinners, cooking together. So really, it was amazing. Uh, but this, okay, this one, this uh, next fact is not uh, good. Most species of gecko don't have eyelids uh, or eyelids, so they lick their own eyes to clean them. Refugees don't do that, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we cannot do that. I, I tried, but I couldn't. Last one, geckos are masters of color. They match their surroundings. That's helpful also uh, in crossing the borders. Really, I use that a lot when I was crossing the borders. <laughs> Unfortunately, this episode comes to an end. I don't want that, but time-wise, we are over our heads. So <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank my amazing guest, Elena Mustaka and uh, Davud Nuri. Thank you so much, really amazing having you here. I would like to thank my co-host, uh, Douglas. Thank you for assisting. I would like to thank the production team, amazing production team. Sonia, come here. Uh, yeah, Ellie this Suda. time it said that she is back, right? Yeah, this time she, she was behind here, the camera. She's not dead. Yeah. She's not <laughs> uh, please, guys, uh, support us. We have Patreon page. We have a lot of cool stuff on website. Ellie, what do we have? 
we still have the laptop sleeves <laughs> there all right <laughs> do you know what they uh, are now no laptops don't have uh, arms why <laughs> are we selling sleeves <laughs> 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 i don't understand all right we have cool t-shirts cool designs amazing uh, designs also you guys you should know that we are looking for a sponsor for this podcast so if it's not you maybe you can help us find one really so we can make this uh, podcast and this organization much much better and uh, that's it. Anyone wants to add something? See you next time in the next episode. Bye bye. See you soon. Peace. Bye. Peace. Peace out. No, no, no. I think it would be fantastic if this was this was a stand up. I was gonna say. Just, just you. I yeah. Mean, you can but really, I was. Uh, but I think he'll be like a gecko. Like, well, right? He'll just like he'll wear the right clothes that we won't even see him. We'll just hear his <laughs> voice, and he'll claim that he wasn't even here. Our host stand up yeah. also. Yeah. I mean, really? What host? Host stand up battles, whatever you call them. You know uh, when you call a lot. You have a lot in America. And you roast. Call a lot of roast. Host. Host. No, like yeah, you have like different hosts of different shows. Yeah, they're also they comedians, and they basically do all the show. But you have a lot of people that aim to become comedians also mm. like attended. Yeah. So if you're a little bit shy for your own solo schedule, you know, like I mean he's Fred not shy when he gets into these little tavernas. Yeah, yeah I'm talking to Greeks, I'm, I'm not shy. I'm doing good. <laughs> yeah. Because so, I'm criticizing them and they <laughs> like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a wrap guys. Awesome. I think nice. we definitely have some outros Thank you, right? guys. Thank you. Thank you. Woo.